Okay, welcome everyone to this. I think what will be like a very exciting one hour where we'll discuss about uh, generative AI for agriculture extension. So let me just quickly start the proceedings. So bef before we start the, the session, you know, let me just share my, quickly, let me share my screen for a minute and show you something. So as I was thinking of, uh, okay, oh my gosh. Okay, I don't think I can find it, okay. Ah, okay. My apologies. I, I just wanted to share something. So maybe, uh, yeah. Okay. So the way we will kind of uh, start this session is, uh, you know, uh, my apologies. I didn't organize myself very well. As I was thinking about this session, uh, you know, for some of my colleagues who are all uh, joining this call from India or, pre pre you know, particularly from the South of India, you know, all of you probably remember this movie called Robo, which I think, uh, you know, which uh, was in the theaters in 2010 and 11, where superstar Rajni Kant, uh, you know, is like a robot, right? And one particular scene in that particular movie is when Rajni Kant, you know, he's like a fully trained, super intelligent robo with like huge computational ability uh, in the looks of our favorite superstar Rajni Kant, right? So he's sitting in a salon and uh, the, the guy at the salon just randomly throws four to five books at Rajni Kant, right? The robo, basically. And Rajni Khan basically just quickly scans those books and he suddenly has all the knowledge from the books and he starts answering questions, right? So 10 years back, this would have looked like almost like a science fiction, right? But cut to 12 years and, uh, you know, with chat GPT and, you know, LLMs, this is actually looking like, okay, uh, this probably was not so far off from reality, right? So this was something that was very... Uh, was playing at the back of my mind as I was thinking of convening this session on generative AI, right? So anyway... Uh, coming to the context of the session, so this is, uh, I have, we've been able, fortunate enough to assemble a great set of speakers. So we will first start off with uh, Soma, who is a, a data scientist with uh, Wadwani AI, which I think is one of the, one of the best organizations that is working on LLMs in India. So Soma, over to you. Uh, you can make your presentations anywhere from, say, 15 minutes to 20 minutes. Uh, sure. Yeah, take it over. And you can see the screen, right? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, first of all, Ram, thanks for the blockbuster introduction. I think <laughs> we can't do justice to that uh, start. You know, I think it's a very apt description of what we are going through with the likes of GPT. Um, the roughly the agenda is. Uh, uh, let me put on full screen. Um, I'll give you like a primer, uh, not at a very detailed level, but a primer on generative AI. And then it's applications uh, in the agriculture context. Okay, roughly that's how we go about. And uh, uh, towards the last, uh, you know, five to six minutes, I'll give you a couple of demonstrations uh, in application. Okay, um, that's the agenda. Um, what we we will cover mostly when we think about generative AI. Typically, we think about uh, text generation, but uh, these days generative AI also includes, you know, text to image, image to image you know, text-to-speech, many variants of generative AI exist. We largely focus on the text generation abilities. Uh, Chat GPT is a very good example of that. Uh, <clears throat> very, very, you know, uh, it sounds actually quite boring when I say this, but uh, all the large language models like Chat GPT, at least the 3.5 and the four versions are doing is, you give a, you give a text input and you expect a text output. That's a, that's a, the most uh, rudimentary and the primitive description of what LLMs are, right? Uh, they take text as input, produce as text as an output. And obviously, you know, uh, these are very sophisticated models. You know, I'm not getting to the building part of it, but but uh, if you think about uh, a function that is given to you, what you expect is a is is a text. Um, um, and 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 uh, we give a particular name to it. The text input that we give to these models is called the prompt. And depending on the kind of instruction that you give in the prompt, the behavior and the functionalities of this large language models can be anything, right? I will give you what can we do with the generative AI, in particular, the models like GPT, you know, how can we uh, put them into work for us? I'll talk about them. Uh, as I mentioned before, we largely focus on text to text, even though I have some applications of, uh, you know, text to image, image generation applications in the agricultural context but those applications are fairly limited at this particular point. Um, if, I, if we recall our high school 
you know, maths class, right? We all understand equation of a straight line, y equals to x plus b or mx plus c, right? Here, x is the input. You can think of x as an input, y as an output, and a and b, the slope and the intercept, are like the parameters that describe what line that you're looking at, right? Obviously, if you change a and b, the slope of the line will change, the intercept of the line will change, right? Uh, this all we understand from our high school maths. Um, so if I, if I simply give a different terminology, X, I call it like input, Y, I call it like an output. The relationship between X and Y is actually codified in terms of these, these uh, you know, A and B, okay? Now, the large language models like the GPT 3.5 are, are, are kind of a glorified versions of these very simple models. Instead of dealing with two parameters in this case, like A and B, I might have 175 billion or more parameters. That's where so-called magical powers of large language models come in. Again, in the context of generative AI, specifically text, you can think of X is a bunch of words or a bunch of tokens, or Y is also a bunch of tokens, right? So text input, text output. Um, again, this is another description of the same thing. Uh, in this case, when we say large means that instead of having two parameters, like I showed before, you would have 100, 170 billion or more. Right, that's the large refers to. Language model in this case refers to is that you give a bunch of text input, you get a bunch of text in output, right? That's a, as simple as it can get. Um, uh, again, what do they do? In this example, there is a model, treat this model as a black box. I'm giving you a text, a sequence of words as an input, the cat sat on the, and I don't know what comes next. I'm expecting the model to produce a, a logical or a, a coherent output, in this case, that's a bad, right? Uh, this is how the models are basically trained. We, this, is a, this is called the language model. You know, what comes next, given a bunch of tokens already exposed to the model, is, is largely the behavior that the models try to emulate. Now, uh, you might see, of course, there are lots of possibilities. In, you know, for example, if you have, let's say, 10,000 words in your vocabulary, which one to pick? There are lots of possibilities. We simply pick up uh, one way to predict the next word is to pick the most likely word that could come given the sequence that will be given to the model. In this case, mat is one word, on, floor, wall, right? Many words are possible. Which one shall we pick up or the model should pick up is the most likely word, right? What is shown with the bar graphs of the, let's say, the, the probabilities of the words that could occur after the cat sat on the, right? This is what uh, the large language models in a predict, which is why these are not like deterministic machines, right? Depending on how much, how can, what kind of variability do you want to see? Maybe instead of choosing a math word, you can choose something else, which is where we tend to see that models kind of a hallucinate because they're generating a non-determinist sequence. Therefore, you expect lots of variations. Even if you give the same prompt or same input, you can expect a very different output depending on, you know, what kind of uh, uh, diversity you want to see in the outputs. Um, let me give a, a sort of like a, a visual feel of what they are. Um, it's the same thing what I described in words, we will just see in action. Um, again, like a, a description, right? A large language model. Of course, we need to start with data. Uh, Ram talk, spoke about four books, right? Now we have gigantic corpus of data, right? Wikipedia, book corpus, so on and so forth. These are all ingested into these models for the sake of training. You need uh, tons and tons of data to train these billion parameter models. A neural network is like glorified y equals to mx plus c that I spoke about, right? You have a bunch of inputs, you produce an output, that's how these models get trained. Uh, uh, yeah, this is not so important. Uh, It's also not that particularly important. Now, if you, uh, when it comes to language models, right? You see a word like Indian food is ranked. What do you expect as an extra, uh, you know, token or a word, right? Maybe it's a fifth in the world. You no, know, that's what, it's a factual knowledge available somewhere, let's say in the Wikipedia. If you get the same input, Indian food is ranked. And what do you expect the model to produce? Maybe it'll produce a fifth in the world or a sixth in the world, right? Depending on what kind of data that was seen. In that sense, we say, these models are a generative in nature. Given input sequence, they produce an output sequence. Definitely it is making sense to us, obviously, but uh, they may, sometimes they may hallucinate. Maybe sometimes they produce factually incorrect knowledge, which is something that we shall be aware of. Then we want to deploy these LLMs in mission critical applications, like healthcare, for example, right? 
uh, of course uh, these these uh, language models can be can be used for many many purposes let me switch back to uh, a, a studio where i like to show what can we do with these large language models you know um, now this is called document summarization for example if you look at let's say wikipedia document it has let's say you know a a a, a page containing let's say 1000 words what if I, you want to simply look at the summary, right? Maybe hundred word summary, right? No, uh, for example, here I can take uh, uh, the the cigars, uh, uh, CGAR, so let's say Wikipedia page, I copy paste. What I'm expecting is that, um, document summary, Wikipedia, uh, Right. In fact, even I can load the Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Uh, I link. can mention C so, uh, link. Yeah. Sorry. And into here, now I can actually, I can actually crawl the Wikipedia page, get it out, and then say, you no. Know, uh, it says uh, action was successful. Let's see if it works. You no. Know, generate the summary. Now, what I'm expecting is that I give this kind of large Wikipedia page article as an input to, let's say, GPT 3.5. I'm instructing GPT to produce a maybe a hundred word uh, a summary, right? This is, an, this is one example of generative AI. Um, again, if a farmers or farmers need to, let's say, or farmers or extension workers in the critical context need to look at, let's say, 30 page document and they want to get insight to the document, we can look at summarization as a language processing task to minimize the attention, to minimize the or maximize the attention span that people would have, right? Um, now you say the oral document is about the International Commission of Legal. This is a different page I loaded. I got the URL wrong, but this is what you typically see. Um, uh, let me see if it works now. Okay, this is this uh, this uh, this uh, task is called summarization. Likewise, we have many many more. Uh, maybe I'll switch to uh, uh, the slide and show them in action, or rather exemplified. Right. Um, I suppose you look at Spider Man is a very good movie. And uh, we want to understand, is it a good or a bad type of movie, right? Maybe you call like a sentiment positive versus negative, right? You, in other words, given a piece of text, you want to tag that particular piece of text with uh, you no know, couple of classes that are already known to you, right? This is called classification problem. Uh, you can use uh, elements like GPT even for classification task. In this case, it's a sentiment analysis of a, of a piece of text, like movie rating. You know, the second application, hopefully you can see the slides, right? I'm not, I did not put on the full screen. Um, suppose you look at a, like a sentence called CGAR has presence over 89 countries. Okay. Uh, I want to know what CGAR is. It's, a, it's an organization, right? It's called entity recognition in the language task. Like 89, obviously we understand 89 is a number, right? So given a piece of text, we, want, we can do things like uh, entity recognition, is this particular word a person or a place, so on and so forth, right? This is another application, broadly speaking. And now again, summarization, the example I gave you uh, with the CR document, like in this case, to Jack and Jill went up the hill, blah, blah, blah. And if you want to say, just give me in four words, Jack broke his leg, right? That's a, that's a summary. Uh, uh, all right, uh, let me, uh, all right, so far so good. Uh, but why why we are so excited about you know, GPT? Uh, I want to take you through a little bit of history. Uh, Ram, please stop anytime. Uh, no worries. Uh, no. Uh, uh, if, like five to six minutes before, like like when we want missed, please please uh, flash. Sure. Okay. No no it's yeah. Uh, this is uh, this is like a pivotal moment in language processing. You know, before Japanese, almost like we can say before GPT and after GPT. Why? You know, let me put a full screen mode. It's a watershed moment. You see, lot lots of open source uh, models out there. GPT being a commercial one. Uh, you no know, uh, proliferate. This, this space proliferated. You know, and we see lots of chatbots, right? Even companies like Databricks, they have a Dolly, you know, Cola from uh, Berkeley, so on and so forth, right? Uh, even Meta released uh, Llama 2, which is an open source model that excited the community. And we, see we, we saw tremendous progress, even in the open source community. But why? Why are we so excited? In fact, it's also causing fears. You know, some graduate students in the language processing world are wondering, you know, if GPT can solve many, many problems, you know, as a, as a PhD student in ling linguistics, what am I supposed to do, right? Almost like an existential crisis, and uh, you know, uh, and it's it's like a gold rush. Lots of VCs are pouring a lot of money into it to figure out, uh, you know, how can we improve the productivity uh, using these technologies. You now we'll we'll discuss some of them. Um, and amazingly, you know, uh, 
uh, they, 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 the GPT itself is like writing bar exams and uh, getting qualified, you know, for legal exams, bar exams, even medical exams, right? So, so they can definitely do well on certain kind of reasoning and certain kind of cognitive uh, tasks. Okay, so it's 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 for real, and the, it's not completely hype, but there is some truth to it. Uh, likewise, you know, because this technology is so powerful, you also have other side of the coin, which is, you know, should we actually should we stop these uh, experiments? Because if you put into the wrong hands, you know, they can be detrimental to the society, right? So world is divided in terms of shall we leverage the technology or shall, should we actually pause the kind of research that is happening? Um, uh, uh, you know, the opening at Dev Day happened two days ago. Again, the world is amazed at what we could do. I'll give a couple of examples. Not, now, not only you can uh, generate text or not only you can talk to your documents, which I show in the demonstrations, but you can also talk to your document uh, images. You can talk to videos, right? In this case, you see a car and you can actually talk to as if that's a person. What am I seeing? Oh, I'm seeing a car. How many wheels does it have? It has four, so on and so forth, right? Likewise, you can give a sketch of the website that you want to build and uh, you know, GPT, the model slide could give you pseudo code, like HTML code with all the you know, bells and whistles. And you can talk to your webcam, webcam feeds. You know? What I'm seeing in my feed, right? You can actually interact with the, so-called non-living object like web cameras, right? This is amazing. So not only we can converse with documents like PDFs and URLs and text, but you can also converse with you know, videos and images, right? Visual question answering, things yeah. like that. Now we are getting into the multi-model world. It's not text, it's not speech, it's not image, a combination of these two. It's a, the, that kind of opportunities are opening up, okay? Sure. Why we are excited about it? Yeah, please Ram. Uh, sorry, uh, so maybe you can uh, try to wrap yeah. up in the next four minutes, perhaps? Yeah. Right, right. I'll show you some demonstrations. Uh, now, one model that can do many, many tasks, as opposed to we have one model for one task that's no longer the case, which is why it is so exciting. You no, know, the, the, the behavior that you want to see in your functionality is actually in the input itself. So uh, it's, it's a very rapid, it's a technological model in that sense. So I'll stop here. Uh, I covered, hopefully I covered enough to... Uh, understand what LLMs can do, and uh, I'll go to the applications. Uh, I'll go to the applications. Okay. Uh, no. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, this application we deployed for the government of India, Minister of Farmer and Health, Farmer and Agriculture and Farmer Welfare. Here the idea is to you no, know, farmers make lots of calls. They're like uh, call centers available. Farmers want to understand whether the grievance is addressed or not, right? Maybe, you no, know, PM Kisan is an insurance scheme uh, launched by the government. They want to know why they did not get the money or when will they get the money, right? It's it's this particular chat application is about that. Okay. Now I, you know, for example, my question is about let's say installment is not received, even though I'm showing a very bare minimal application, uh, but you get the idea, right? So now with the farmer. Uh, can directly interact with an a a AI agent in a very natural looking way. Uh, so now the bot can actually retrieve the corresponding response. In this case, uh, you no know, Meenakshi Devi is a is a character in the case of uh, to demonstrate the application. Now, see, now the it's talking to the uh, farmer saying that you no, know, uh, uh, you can check the status of your uh, income or sorry, not income, your insurance by looking at your know your status module in this particular application, right? Uh, it's not per se generator, but we leverage the abilities of large language models to understand what kind of query that is coming to me and appropriately route to that particular uh, uh, route for that particular query to a templated response. Right? This is one application. Uh, again, it's not generative in nature because we want very deterministic responses. It's something that we should worry. Is LLM the right right kind of technology to deploy where we expect very specific answers, right? If you directly take an LLM and deploy, maybe it can hallucinate and produce a syntactically correct URL, but it doesn't exist. It's possible, right? Mm -hmm. Let me take you to another application. Um, this is, uh, again, Kisan Call Center. The idea is that farmers might have many, many, many questions. It could be about Monday price. It could be about crop insurance. It could be about weather. Uh, weather is uh, like, a you know, about 80% of the traffic comes because of the weather, right? Uh, now, let me uh, showcase a very different application of LLMs. No, I already wrote this particular question. Uh, uh, you can see, right? I'm actually asking, what is the weather like in Bangalore, right? Then I'm asking, is Bangalore hotter than Delhi? For a, for a, for a human beings, it's a very simple question to answer. 
Now look at the kind of things that we need to do. We don't understand that this question is actually about weather. We need to make a comparison, right? So therefore we can use even large level models to break up a complex query. It, it's simple looking, but underneath you need to know the weather. You need to make comparative statements. So a little bit of computation, a little bit of reasoning needs to happen. So underneath we'll say, I need to call the weather API. Okay, and I need to pass Bengaluru as a location and today as a date. Likewise, I need to pass another query to the weather API. Uh, you know, Delhi is a location, today is the weather. I need to get these two, I need to make a comparison. Maybe I need to write, invoke these two, pass these two parameters, 22, 22 degrees centigrade and 21 degrees centigrade to, let's say a comparative statement, right? And then, and then bring the result back to the format. So now we can use large language models to not only do simple classification, but use them like agents use them like routers and uh, even communicate with APIs in with English as a language. That, that's remarkable. We don't need to, for example, code up. In fact, in OPA, OpenAI Dev Day, and as Sam Altman showed, that you can actually create a custom GPT using simple natural languages. That's where we are. I'll stop here and any questions sure. I'll be happy to uh, take or more examples I can I can show. I, I'll pause sure. here. Over to you. Sure. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Soma. I think that was really, I think, a great start. And uh, you kind of you also concluded with some solid demonstrations. So maybe in the interest of time, what I'll do is we'll move to the second part of the presentation. So allow me to share my screen. Uh, can you stop sharing yours, uh, Soma? Yeah, yeah thank yeah, you. Yeah. All right, all right. So can someone please confirm that uh, you're able to see my screen as well as my deck in the yeah. presenter mode? We're going to move it to out of notes mode. With those three okay. buttons, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is. Yeah. Looks yeah. It's good. good. Uh, example of where uh, we are trying to use open AIs, uh, or rather, sorry, uh, yeah. So anyway, so this is a small uh, case study from a piece of work that we are currently undertaking with the India Med Department in India, right? So just to give you a bit of the context, the problem context here, uh, you all, most of you agree that agriculture and dependent livelihoods are very highly dependent on weather, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, fortunately, the field of meteorology itself has been uh, evolving and has been, you know, Today, they have a lot of supercomputers, a lot of hardware, plus there has also been a lot of improvements in, in the areas of numerical weather forecasting, et cetera, et cetera. Consequently, today you have a ton of climate and weather data that is available to you, right? So things like weather forecasts are today increasingly available at finer resolution, spatial and temporal forecasts, right? But what does it really mean for a farmer, right? See, currently, uh, you know, existing climate information services for agriculture, if you really look at them closely, what they do mostly is, they most of more often than not, they kind of disseminate weather forecast to the farmers, right? In my opinion, that is nothing but you are just giving data to the farmer, right? The real uh, uh, value add to the farmer could be when you take the weather forecast and you combine it with another, you know, um, another piece of knowledge, which is something called as agronomy or crop management. And if you can on real time, based on the real time weather forecast, if you are able to translate weather forecast into some sort of actionable advisory services to farmers, I think that probably is to higher uptake and impact, right? And thankfully, uh, India has been one of those countries which has really invested in this area. It's an emerging area called agro advisory services. So the India Med Department has a division called the agro advisory services, wherein what they do is they have these, uh, you know, okay, let me just move to my next slide. So here is a pictorial representation of India's uh, agro advisory services system, the way it functions, right? So please, uh, uh, you know, if you can pay a little bit, okay, if I, let me just put my pointer. Okay, I hope you can see my pointer. So here you have IMD where my pointer is, right? So IMD uh, is the apex uh, med department in India, which is into generating a lot of climate and weather forecast, right? What they have done is they have established something called as AMFUs. So India has about 130 agromet field units. These uh, and uh, India has about 650 agricultural districts approximately. So that's one agromet field unit that typically caters to about five to six districts, right? So each AMFU, the way they function is twice a week on Tuesdays and on Fridays, these AMFUs, they come together. They look at the IMD's forecast data as well as the, 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 the weather that was experienced by those four or five districts that are under their jurisdiction. And accordingly, they look at these data points. And because these AMFUs are situated 
regionally they are you know situated uh, in those locations they use a lot of their knowledge about the cropping practices and uh, you know existing cultural you know agricultural practices in that particular region so what they do is they kind of translate these weather forecasts into some kind of crop and district specific advisories right so that's been a system that's pretty much been operational in india for the last 15 years it has demonstrated a lot of impact as well and since 2008 what india has done is once these amfus are generating those district and crop specific advisories uh, india government of india has been using mobile data platforms like there is a platform called mkisan uh, they are also using a variety of sources like mass broadcasting sources like radio and television so what they are doing is they are using these channels to disseminate these advisories that are created by amfus right but all seems working well but again what is also happening as i have told to you is uh, you know the field of meteorology is itself evolving very rapidly is getting better and better right so today you have imd has the ability to generate very fine scale resolution forecasts almost at the level of a block which is a sub district right so and honestly the amfus probably do not have the time or the bandwidth to start generating block specific advisories from generating district specific advisories which itself was a gigantic task they do not have the time to start generating block specific advisories as well right this is where imd and uh, you know my team uh, under the one cgr innovation under digital innovation we've been trying to do this pilot uh, with uh, imd and trying to explore if there are any ways to kind of automate the development of uh, you know block and uh, uh, block and crop specific advisories using uh, you know using the forecast okay so anyway so i'll just give you a very quick uh, overview of how we implemented this project okay so in 2019 in fact uh, my colleague satish also is on this call right now he is with simit but i am with ilri uh, when we were both there uh, we were pa we, we were building this application called megdoot uh, for imd where basically what happened was so initially imd created the system called agro dss right so this agro dss is a very simple digital platform where all the 130 amfus in the country they were logging into that agro dss platform and based on the climate and the weather forecast data for a district uh, they were you know they were also inputting the crop specific advisory for that particular district into this agro dss system okay and then uh, apart from this agro dss imd already had databases where they were having district uh, level uh, data about what was the weather recorded the previous day they were also having the forecast for the next five days they also had a lot of other databases where they were also creating uh, you know these uh, what you call as you know nowcasts which are almost like three hours advanced advisories anyway cutting going very quickly so we created this megdoot application uh, which had its at its back end a database which was connecting through apis to all these different uh, you know 9 to 10 different databases that were uh, sitting within imd and then megdoot was practically aggregating all these different data as well as advisories within this app called megdoot so that the farmer would basically have a single app and for any of the 650 districts in the country the farmer could select that particular district and for that particular district the farmer would be able to say what was the weather recorded in the morning what are the crop specific advisories that were generated by the amfu that was connected so on and so forth right and this system has been continuing for four years so starting 2022 what we did was we picked two districts we said okay if an amfu has issued like an amfu in ludhiana you know somewhere in april 2019 for the week of april 19th if they have given an advisory for rice saying that rice farmers can today harvest their crop you know the fact is the amfu there or at least we made an assumption the amfu gave that advisory looking at the data right so here was kind of you know going back to soma's uh, you know the the y is equal to ax plus z here was basically output which was in the form of a text format which was an advisory a crop specific advisory and the inputs were basically the weather that was observed by the mfu for the free for the previous one week and the forecast that the mfu was seen so we thought that perhaps there is a potential for us to kind of build some sort of a machine learning model and then also integrate that with probably an llm so that we practically demonstrate an early ability of using llms to almost mimic the the human expert so to say right so very quickly so this is again a quick uh, picture of uh, the workflow we did so as you can see here 
uh, this is, you know, this data, which was the observed weather data, the crop advisory data and the forecasted weather data. Uh, these were data that were existing for the previous four years. We had to do some data pre-processing because no data, you know, is, is readily, uh, you know, usable in the machine learning context. There was also a lot of gap filling that we do, had to do. More importantly, the output in our case, which was a crop advisory, was a text. And honestly, machines don't understand text. So we had to do some text encoding so that we converted the advisories into some sort of a numbers, uh, which could then become an output variable uh, to a machine learning model. So based on that, we, we experimented with a few models. Finally, we realized that the I mean, there is not a lot of data that we had also available, to be very honest with you. So under that context, uh, our data science uh, teams decided that probably the naive Bayesian model would be the most appropriate. So once we, uh, you know, basically trained the naive Bayesian model, we also tested that naive Bayesian model with the training model. What we did was uh, we experimented this particular model output somewhere, I think, in April or May of 2023. So what we did was on in April or May of 2023, we took this naive Bayesian model. And we input the observed weather data for the previous week. We also put input the forecast for the following week. And we fed that into the naive Bayesian model. And the output of that naive Bayesian model was like a very incoherent set of keywords or text. And that incoherent set of keywords or text, we basically then fed into OpenAI. And then we prompted the OpenAI. We basically used prompt engineering and told the OpenAI, construct a, you know, a grammatically correct and a human comprehensible advisory out of the stuff I've given, right? And the results have been very promising, right? And another thing what we also did was like, what we also noticed is, uh, you know, when uh, these AMFUs are generating advisories, they are expected to generate, uh, you know, uh, kind of, they are expected to generate one comprehensive advisory. They are also then expected to kind of uh, take this advisory and convert it into a format so that it fits into an SMS channel as well, right? So they are also given tasks. So we again used OpenAI to take the same advisory and we asked OpenAI to generate us three formats of the same advisory. We said, take this entire advisory, shrink it into 256 characters so that the same can be disseminated through MKSAN's uh, portal, right? Then we also gave it to the same thing to OpenAI and said, construct this into a humanly readable, comprehensible uh, you know, text. Yeah. Anyway, let me just uh, quickly move on. So these are the actual results. And as you can see here, and uh, so I, I will not reveal the name of the district or the date we have actually generated this advisories. So, you know, take for instance, how will our model perform? So for this particular district, for the rice crop, this is what the IMD's AMFU's, AMFU team said that the farmer should do, right? But this is what our naive Bayesian classifier generated. So our naive Bayesian classifier based on the uh, you know, the input data from the past, it said that due, for that kind of weather condition and during those times, that particular region has a chance of, you know, uh, occurrence of brown, brown plant hopper disease, right? This is what our naive Bayesian class were prepared. But we fed the, when we fed the same thing into OpenAI, it gave us much richer text. And what the LLMs also did was from their own pre-trained uh, models, they also gave more information about what brown plant hoppers are, what are some of the good agricultural practices that farmers can do? Like, you know, farmers should be alert to unseasonal changes or how the brown plant hopper can actually look like, right? So here is a case where we have used a, a machine learning model to identify the primary advisory and then used OpenAI to kind of polish the text, improve the text, and also used OpenAI's pre-training data to kind of enrich the content, right? And here is again an example where, uh, you know, for that particular week, that AMFU did not even prepare a text that would be suitable for an SMS dissemination. But whereas we used OpenAI and it was also able to generate a 256 character uh, thing as well. So anyway, moving on to my conclusion slide, I know Soma touched on this a bit. See, uh, LLMs are great, especially in terms of language tasks. But if you, if you are trying to create some sort of a decision support system, uh, I do, I, I mean, I, you did mention Soma that probably the latest versions of LM, LLMs have the ability to do computations as well, but at least probably that could be a very costly computational exercise. So perhaps one approach could be develop a machine learning model, which kind of serves your data support needs, but pair that with an open AI to kind of improve the comprehensibility and, and the language, uh, uh, you know, the language construction around how you communicate the advisories, right? So in that sense, I think fusing ML models to generate decision outputs and integrating these with LLMs could be a way to package decision support outputs into human language forms, right? That's one. Secondly, I think some of LLMs task, uh, you know, abilities like translation, question answering, text summarization, et cetera, 
sometimes these are demo, domain agnostic and these i think are hugely relevant especially you know in the agricultural extension context where very often we are we are, we, we are confronted with a situation where farmers have a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of issue in terms of real communicating with you know science with farmers right and last but not the least i think uh, uh, you know as an ict for the for the community we all have some sort of experience of using radio as a channel of dissemination using television as a channel of di dissemination now you are speaking about mobile app as a channel of disse dissemination but i'm reasonably sure uh, with the prevalence of llms and especially conversational uh, ai frameworks perhaps this could also be another area potentially a new social science area where uh, uh, we could really uh, think through in terms of whether having our science uh, uh, you know translated to farmers in a conversational ai context does that lead to a you know a better uptake or comprehension right so that's kind of my concluding presentation thanks a lot for the time again uh, maybe so steve I invite you for the next presentation. Okay, yeah, thanks, Ram. Uh, and yeah, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to join this really cool, really exciting uh, uh, set of presentations. So what I want to do is talk about what is actually really a very simple uh, use case. Um, but I think it's a nice illustration of, of the, the value of LLMs in, as becoming tools in sort of our day-to-day -day interactions. So uh, here at ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute, um, we are trying to improve um, the breeds and the productivity of cattle through a genetics route. Um, I'm working particularly on, on dairy cattle. Uh, and, and that's the way that that livestock systems differ dramatically from crop systems is that we can't set up test um, plots, test fields. We have to use real world data from from real world farmers, real world cows out there in the real world. And of course, that's that's a challenge in terms of data collection, but it's a, also a great opportunity. It means that we get real world data that's applicable in the real world. Um, and, and of course, the biggest challenge here has been getting data from real farmers about their, their real cows. Um, and the way we have do that, we establish a kind of quid pro quo with the farmers so that in return for, uh, in return for submitting data, we support them with management information. Um, but, but hitherto, we've relied on, on relatively crude tools, basically survey tools, ODK, uh, for example, uh, where data is collected and it's a one-way process. Data comes from the farmer into a database. Um, and the other feature of our databases is that they contain lots of confidential and personal data about our end users. Uh, next slide, Ram, thanks. Sure. So what we wondered is, can we use AI tools to facilitate uh, a much more natural language engagement with our with our data systems by end users and particularly by farmers. Can they ask natural language questions like, "Hey, how much milk did uh, did I produce this month, and how does it compare to this same month last year?" For instance, those kinds of general questions, and also questions from uh, policymakers, for instance, or or, uh, or others in, interested in sort of performance of of dairy systems questions like you know where's the where's the most milk produced in ethiopia uh in february those kinds of natural language questions um but but one of the problems of course is that the data is confidential we can't expose the data to the to a chat bot to the open ai um and it's not really structured in a format. Uh, it, it's actually an incredibly complex data set. And it's not really structured so that you could simply throw it at, at an AI and, and expect the AI to understand it. Um, so what we've done, if I could have the next slide, please. Sure. It's taken a really simple, a simple approach of using the AI as a, as a natural language processor to generate SQL. And it really is as simple as that. So, so our end user asks a question in a chatbot type interface at the moment. Um, 
and we provide that text to to uh, the LLM together with information on the structure of our database. Uh, and what we found is that the uh, the LLM can give us really very good, very accurate SQL, uh, which we can then point at the database and generate a result. So critically, the LLM has never seen the data. All it sees is the data structure. And then uh, the result, so then we run that SQL locally, uh, the result uh, comes back and then that can be thrown back if we want to, that could be thrown back at uh, a machine learning system in order to, to draw graphs, draw pictures, illustrate it, draw maps, for instance, uh, and, and make it available back to the requester. So, I mean, what's really nice about this is that all the advantages of, of the large language model for instance, retaining context, retaining context, so so that the end user can have a very natural conversation. You can say, "Hey, what was my best cow this week?" And then, "How did that go last week?" And then, you know, "What was my worst cow?" And and it becomes a very becomes a very natural uh, uh, language um, uh, and a very natural conversation of the farmer with our with our data. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's a, there's a simple example here of an interaction. Uh, and of course, the LLM also handles uh, translation. So this is a question in Kiswahili. Uh, on the left here, the farmer says, hello. Uh, the system replies, hi, how can I help you today? And then the farmer asks the question, which farm in Arusha produced the least milk on this particular day? So, you know, a completely free text format. That's converted into SQL. SQL spits out the answer, and then the and then that's that's portrayed uh, as uh, information on the amount of milk, the location, the district, the farm name, and it draws a map. Uh, because um, I, I've had to, of course, blur out the, the details here and and pixelate the details um, because that is confidential data. And if you go to the next slide, that's one of the features. We can whitelist categories of data in, in a very granular way using this system. Because as I mentioned, the, the, the only two things that the, that the AI model needs to know is the natural language question and the database structure. So all we do, if we want to hide a field, we just don't tell the, data, they don't tell the, the, the model about it. And so it can't be considered. Uh, and even if the user tries to ask for confidential data, like ask what's the telephone number of of the person who had the, the worst milk production in Arusha, uh, the, the 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 system responds with, "I don't know anything about telephone numbers because we haven't told, we haven't, it hasn't, that didn't pass the whitelist, uh, and so the system was not was not aware of it, is not capable of producing a SQL." Uh, that uh, that that pulls that data out out of the system. So you know it's it's a really quite a simple um, quite a, quite a simple uh, approach. That I, and, and my feeling is that these kinds of pieces of 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 AI in 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 a workflow um, will become more and more useful. I mean, I, and I guess some of the lessons we've learned so far in this, this proof, proof of concept model is prompt engineering is critical. Um, mm. We've got to design our, our prompting um, very carefully. And the other is that uh, we've got to think about the, obviously we're asking the, the AI to, to, to make a best guess about the kind of data that's held in each column of a table, for instance, and how the tables, and how the tables uh, uh, cross link. Uh, which means that we've got to be fairly, you've got to use fairly intuitive names and structures for, for database. But that's a good thing to be pushed into doing anyway, of course. Um, and, and going forward, what we see is, is combining this kind of approach where we're directly interrogating a database through natural language through also at the same time, mixing it with a corpus of, of, of training data, uh, which helps the farmer to make decisions in, in a broader context. Um, so right now the farmer might ask, when do I expect this cow to come in heat next? Uh, but you might also want to say, want to combine that with details about where the nearest AI provider is, about the 
about a reminder to to look out for uh, body condition of this particular animal. Uh, pay attention to feed if you're thinking about it. But, you know, attempting AI in a few weeks' time, uh, and, and these kinds of questions. So, so I, I think what we can see here is is very specific, very specific and tailored, uh, extremely granular information coming back to a, to the requester by a mix of personal data um together with uh together with a, a corpus of, of training data and and certainly in in real life it's what where farmers get their most advice from is from their neighbors there's no doubt about that uh they don't the, they don't mess around with data systems and with phones and with uh with anything else the, the very first time uh, and perhaps the most trusted data that it comes from comes from their neighbor and and i, I know i'm wondering if we can we can move to the stage where uh, we have a very, a very virtual, a very, a very knowledgeable um, neighbor and a very personalized neighbor sitting on the on the farmer's phone. So yeah, thanks, Ram. I'll pass it back to you. All right, thank you, thanks, uh, Steve. I, yeah, over to you, Satish. I'll stop sharing. But as uh, as um, Satish is setting up, you know, I just go back to the presentation from Soma where he was referring to an example where you will have LLMs beginning to also start calling APIs and doing some of the stuff on our own. In fact, in you know, my case study and your case study as well, we are actually, you are building an SQL query using an open AI, whereas in my workflow, you know, I had the output of a machine learning model feeding into an LLM and then giving output. I think, yeah, we are all kind of converging. We are all going into the same space. Yeah, over to you, Satish. You are also in the notes, you are on mute, Satish. And you're also in the notes mode. I think you need to put it into a present, hide the. Sadish, you there? Sadish? He's muted. There you go, Sadish. Yeah. yeah, now you're sharing your screen. Okay, so, and you're able to hear me, right? We are able to hear you, but we don't see, you. yeah, now we see your deck. That's fine, yes, go ahead. Okay, fine, great, thanks. Okay, so thanks, Ram, thanks, uh, Soma and uh, uh, Steve. I mean, this was a wonderful presentation, and uh, I think the first uh, slides covered the basics of AI and everything, and i just going to kind of uh, jump on to uh, what we kind of try to do with some of the upcoming uh, kind of generative uh, AI models, especially in terms of for research. Okay, so what uh, Steve and Ram presented were kind of more on the farmer side, and uh, I mean in farmer as consumers, but we are looking at researchers and academicians as consumers here, and this is part of the work that we are doing as part of the CGR initiative on digital innovation, and uh, which we kind of uh, are kind of launching a new platform called CoLab, which is actually a collaborative lab where we want people to come kind of come engage and talk about work around and innovate together uh on digital innovations for agri food systems okay and the platform has three key pillars one is the collaborative space where people come join kind of uh, discuss engage with each other code code uh, co-develop stuff and then another one is learning network where we are kind of bringing on courses and digital literacy and uh, other uh, fantastic stuff on mentoring and other stuff. Okay, the third thing is what we call as DINA, which is the Digital Innovation Navigation Assistant. Okay, so this is where we are kind of trying to kind of employ some kind of uh, AI models to kind of uh, kind of uh, take some of the text that's kind of buried into huge uh, PDFs into some uh, consumable uh, synthesized knowledge for the users and researchers, right? So this is what we call as DINA. DINA is the AI powered uh, <clears throat> search assistant, which is called Digital Innovation Navigation Assistant, DINA. -D -D and this actually, if you look at it, like uh, what we have done is like, we have kind of, uh, so the, the need for this is like once, I mean, we have this like BARD, we have the uh, chat GPT and everything. The problem with those kind of stuff is like, it kind of consumes inputs from various sources, which we may not be able to know or trace. And it's not always 100% accurate and, and, it, and it may be biased as well, right? So in terms of to kind of uh, stop that or kind of to kind of come up with a different option where researchers and academicians and other enthusiasts can kind of look at uh, very safe curated knowledge okay and if they have a 
AI on top of it, or we could do that. So what we did is we kind of started curating evidences on digital innovation. This whole platform is about digital innovation. So we kind of looked at documents, publications, research articles on digital innovation, and we curated about like, so far we have curated about 750 and we are kind of continuing to do that. So we kind of curated these documents. Okay, on top of that, we kind of brought in the uh, OpenAI uh, model uh, from ChatGPT, right? Uh, uh, so we kind of built on top of that. And whenever you ask a query, it kind of responds from these 750 documents or the documents that we have kind of put in the database. So that's what we are doing. In addition to that, we are also trying to kind of comp use the same prompt or query and uh, get responses from the open, openly available chat GPT or OpenAI or BARD and also populate that response. And we want to kind of compare and see or show it to the users in terms of how uh, the response for their prompt or query comes from a privately private database of uh, this thing and then from the public uh, uh, GPTs, uh, either OpenAI or BART. Okay, and uh, the idea is like we want to kind of do a research as we said, it's a collab, it's a laboratory as well. We want to kind of see user inputs and uh, we are kind of trying to kind of get user feedback to kind of understand which version is good and how it is good and to what extent it is good. And so maybe uh, by next edition of the ICT for Ag, we we'll, might have some stronger uh, data to kind of uh, save how it works and everything. So now, so this 750 documents that I've kind of just spoken is coming from curated evidences and resources which are populated by the DI initiative itself. There's a work package on uh, the three work packages. So the mostly evidence is curated by the work package one. And then the, there was some kind of work which was done in the previous uh, 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 what you call uh, initiative mode on big data platform. So there's something called a, uh, evidence clearing house where data has been collected in terms of different digital innovation so we have kind of curated that then the cg space the cgi uh, uh, research repository that i mean and then the big data platform and other uh, sources where we have uh, resources on digital innovation so this is the 750 documents where we kind of curated at this point of time okay now going to the schematic flow so the way it works is like the user uh, asks for a I um, mean, ask a question or a query and it prompts and that kind of gets searched into uh, uh, the curated trusted source of evidences that we have built to some 50 documents, which is which is built on top of an open AI, uh, which is the chat GPT open AI. And then like we also have the uh, same query passed on to the public open AI chat GPT and the same question passed on to the BARD as well, which is Google's. Then we kind of get the synthesized response from all the three, and that is kind of presented in a user interface where the user could kind of read and compare all the three, uh, the, what do you call, all the three uh, uh, versions of the responses that they have got. And there's a kind of a quick, a simple star rating that we have put in to kind of understand from the users in terms of which one is better and kind of stuff. So this is in terms of what we have done and quickly taking you through the, tech part of it or the process flow in terms of like curated. So what we did is like these 750 documents have been, I mean, those are all mostly PDFs, 90% of them are PDFs. So those had to be converted uh, uh, into text files and those text files are broken down into small chunks that the uh, uh, system could understand uh, for training purposes. And that's kind of, we use the open AI uh, model for that. And uh, then it's been processed using the lang chain and then the, whatever chunks are kind of uh, processed have been kind of stored in a database. And uh, then there is another database. There are two databases, there's a reason to this. What we understood is every time we kind of, because these 750 documents that we are adding to the system is actually, we're not adding at one single go. So we are kind of starting curating and maybe in a day we kind of uh, are able to kind of uh, find like 20, 30 documents every day. And we kind of add that at an incremental phase to the uh, database. And what happens once we run the database, I mean, with every time we run it, it actually costs a lot and the resources are a lot. Okay, so what we did is we came up with an idea of like only running that particular 20 documents of that particular day and then convert it and then store it in an integrated da database where we have already ra ran the thing for the previous uh, uh, documents that we have been uploaded. So here's something which we kind of try to kind of do away with the cost and resources and then we merge the database and then like we use the rest the I mean, Django uh, framework to kind of bring the UI interface. Okay, so this is the screen. Okay, maybe quickly in two seconds, I mean, two minutes, I can kind of take you to the actual platform. Uh, Ram, just confirm if you are seeing the collab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. able to see so this yeah. is the platform i'll kind of quickly go to the actual dina yeah so here is the dina so i click on the dina and uh, uh, we have some pre uh, populated questions as well but i'll just kind of since we are talking about uh, let uh, i mean today's session i'll just kind of ask a question okay uh, impacts of uh, iot in uh, okay iot in agriculture so this is actually searching and we also have something okay let let it come okay so on the right and on the left hand side here this part of the screen where you have the text this is the text which is coming from this 750 curated document okay and we had to kind of uh, kind of add a lot of prompts in terms of to kind of restrict uh, uh the model to kind of not to get things from the outside uh the public chat gpt and this is what we get from the public chat gpt and this is what you get from the bard okay and on the right hand side is a knowledge graph which is a different process but we are kind of putting it here so that the people also could understand the different documents it's coming from and everything so this is slightly different from the yeah i think sure. okay so ram i'm stopping here ram any sure sure yeah yeah i think so uh, satish your intention was to show it in a ppt only right because i see some participants are saying that uh, uh, they were only seeing your ppt i think you you wanted to show your ppt only right but you wanted to show oh. the complete part layout on a ppt or no, did I, you I did you for the i i did i did uh, the last i demonstrated the actual platform itself okay oh, sorry okay. okay so maybe in the interest of time why don't you put the link to the collab uh, yeah, yeah, i'll put it so in the chat yeah. yeah so sorry so yeah to the participants i think yeah so anyway uh you know i think this is a very exciting session and i just feel that maybe we should have uh, slightly been we should have had a slightly longer session but nonetheless there is just uh, one question i don't know who is it directed at it said what percentage of knowledge artifacts is available in pdfs do you suggest the next generation to make other formats available not only pdfs so who can who can maybe can i request soma can you maybe you want to take a shot at that Uh, I think now we're going towards uh, any format is okay. Now PDF is just a container. If the document is digital PDF, then you you can extract the text pretty easily, right? So even if the PDF contains its infograph, etc., we are looking at multi-model capabilities. So ultimately, you know, do you still want to talk to like a documents images? That's also possible. So in some sense, I think the container and the format doesn't matter. Going forward, we will be like uh, plugins will be available for any. uh content regardless of the format and the storage okay thanks thanks okay uh maybe courtney can i request you if uh i see just one question is there something that uh, you probably are seeing anywhere that i might not have covered do you want to come in yes let me see this one is for soma um how can one take an llm and try to adapt it to a specific domain Yeah, that's a great question. Basically, there are three primary ways in which you can adapt an LLM to your needs. One is obviously, you know, Ram, Sapeshin, Stephen. They spoke about, uh, you know, prompts, right? As we call prompting, is all you need. Therefore, prompting is one way to control the behavior. You know, uh, uh, that's one. Now, second is, uh, if if you have your own custom data, you know, for example, is the input this kind of output I'm expecting? Just like traditional machine learning, but in this case, you have a bunch of text like input output based. If you can create a fairly small set of data, like thousand, you know, examples, is also good enough, with which you will be able to, you know, uh, take a either commercial a, a commercial LLM like an OpenAI, you can do that, or you can also take a, a public open source API uh, models like. Uh, 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 Lama is is one great example. Recently, we have this tool. Right, that's second way. The third way is to, which is a little more technically involved, is to say you want to see only certain words to be appearing in your text output. That's not very straightforward to control it, but this something will, will be extremely important. Um, like for example, I want to generate a prescription, or I want to generate an advisory on the fly without having a curated source of knowledge. Right, in which case, I don't want, I do not want to, let's say, produce. A, a seemingly cut but factually incorrect uh, pesticide it doesn't exist right so you might you might want to control the generate output itself you know frameworks like hugging face will give you mm. some ability in other words you want to favor some some words as opposed to other words right there's a primarily three ways in which we can do domain adaptation prompting is easiest of it uh, fine tuning is uh, next easiest thing uh, and uh, controlling the output is technically hard but if if your domain requires you to 
puts that kind of safeguards you need to do it thank you thank you any any other questions courtney no that's it that's it okay uh, if not uh, maybe uh, okay so we are almost at the top of the hour so if yeah. there are no further questions uh maybe we conclude maybe uh, maybe as as a way to kind of instigate so maybe soma a quick uh toward conclusion from you toward conclusion from you steve and toward conclusion from you satish that's how we'll close the session i'm yeah. sorry two sentence conclusion not two words so i'm so sorry yeah yeah, yeah. no for me i think llms provide a you know a very you know great opportunity but we need to look at the foundations i mean why is it important to solve this particular problem that's always the thing uh so so technology is like a like a, a banana and like a monkey you know should am i is it like a new toy to play with or are we generating real value uh but definitely these are like game changers we need to find the right value proposition steve uh yeah so what i'm hearing is that llms are fantastic at at mining free text data but a lot of a lot of data is in very structured databases which contains a lot of the structure itself contains a lot of information and i i can't yet see how it it, it gets difficult to 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 mine those intelligently using llms and i think there's some work to be done there this, there was talk about is your is your data uh, ai ready and we need to be clear what that means satish yeah ram so my two words is it's the beginning okay and my two sentences like that uh, uh, uh i mean uh, it's kind of going to be a game changer okay in terms of especially i could see especially in terms of end users and rural folks and farmers uh, in terms of where we have large language models is going to kind of translate in a better way than a human could do for large scale i think that's going to be very helpful and it's going to be helpful in scaling technologies thank you okay sure sure yeah and in the same spirit so maybe i will just uh, deliver all the uh, the the concluding remark so i agree with uh, what all my colleagues have said i think but see fundamentally uh, where llms are probably uh, a real watershed moment is finally we figured out how a computer can uh, can start uh, creating content in a format that most humans have been doing for generations that is language right so finally you today you have computers able to kind of start generating uh you know stuff that is easily comprehensible for humans so therefore i think you know all these days computers have pretty much been generating and communicate in the form of numbers but finally we have that sort of that missing bridge and using that missing bridge the massive corpus of knowledge that computers are storing and generating today you have the abilities for generative ai to kind of convert that or translate that into a format that is easily uh comprehensible to human beings right so in that sense i think this probably is a watershed moment but as as my all my colleagues have put it very elegantly uh you know every new technology also comes with a lot of issues a lot of discussions around ethics etc etc right so i think uh, along with all the investments in technology and everything we also need to think in terms of the guardrails that we really need to invest in to ensure that these technologies don't create sort of the perverse outcomes uh, that a lot of us uh, rightfully are also you know uh, sensitive to so to say so on that note uh, i'd like to conclude uh, the session thanks a lot to all the participants and all the others who uh, who uh, participated in this session i really hope uh, that this one hour uh has been a truly wonderful and an enriching experience for you and thank you once again soma steve satish for contributing to the session have a good day everyone thank, thank you have a good day. thank you thanks, thanks courtney thank bye